Okay, so I've been working on these ideas behind this talk for over a year, and I struggled to get them down into 30 minutes. <laughs> but I did get them down to 20 minutes, but in the last few minutes, I've been trying to get them down to 10 minutes. So hold on to your pants. Uh, I'm gonna throw a lot of information at you, but luckily for you, I'm a pretty slow learner, so maybe that year doesn't matter too much. Okay, so I'm Chris Conley. I build software at Monetate. And I'm going to talk about Hangman today. The game that we're playing, we have 170,000 words. And every game we play, it's completely randomly se selected. And this is pretty obvious, but our goal is to choose the correct word eventually. And we want to minimize the body parts on, a, on our drawing. We're going to play 25,000 games. And then we're going to take the average number of body parts that we use to guess the correct word. And, and the numbers that I'm going to show you are just using nine-letter words, but the same principles apply to the whole dictionary. So first, this really isn't a strategy, but let's just for a baseline, let's randomly select a letter and see what we get. So should start playing. He doesn't look too happy. All right, so we're just under 16 body parts with a random, and we're also going to uh, track average guesses. So let's see how our naive strategy works. This is similar to what you did in, in your childhood. Let's just take the most common letters in the dictionary and let's always choose that in that order. First E, S, then I. Another way of ch saying choosing the most common letter is saying we're gonna maximize our chance of success. So what do we get with that? All right, nine body parts. That's expected, better than random. Here's an overview. But our knowledge isn't static. We can do better than this. And there's two parts to that. We can take inventory of what we know and how to act. We're gonna keep the part of how we act the same. We're gonna choose the most common letter. But we're gonna start to take feedback. And in this game, we can do that by whittling down our dictionary every single time. So at this point in the game, we know that we have guessed correctly, S-R-E, and incorrectly I. And that gives us eight words left out of a possible 25,000. And it's pretty obvious if you're maximizing for success, A is your choice. Six out of eight times you'll get it correctly. So there we go, cool. We're, if you remember, we had nine, now we're down to seven. But let's look at this again. Not only do we know that we've guessed correctly S, R, and E, we know exactly the positions. So we can say, hey, only give me the words left in the dictionary that have an S in the first position, and similarly for the, the other letters. So let's do that. Whoa, all right, cool. By taking inventory of everything we know about the current state of the game, we've gone from our naive strategy of nine body parts all the way down to 1.41. And one thing I didn't mention uh, is that the average guesses, we're, t we're keeping track of that because that's how fast we get to our goal. Whereas average body parts is our, you know, our average failure for what we're trying to get to. So the takeaways, this is, this is basic. We know that we should take feedback, right? We've heard that before. Little subtle thing is we want to take inventory of what we know, but then we have to act on it. And, and, and you're like, well, yeah, of course, like that's stupid. <laughs> but I don't know about you, but I've ignored customer feedback before. I thought my version of the world was the right way, and I ignored what they did. And I'm sur sure there's other, lots of other examples just like that. All right, so we know what we know. Now we're gonna work on our strategy. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna look at information gain. So instead of maximizing for success, we're gonna maximize for information gain. So we're back at our same example. Now we're gonna look at the letter choice G instead of A or T. At this point, yes, we have a, a greater chance of failure because there are four words that we could guess that we get an in incorrect letter, but we're guaranteed to end up with only four, four words or less on our next turn. Whereas on A, if we chose correctly, we would still have six words left in our possible set of words. So we're gonna choose G. We did that intuitively, but there's actually an equation for information and for entropy that we can calculate to give us the exact answer so we can gain the exact most information every single time. 
So let's look at that. Ooh, if you remember, we're a little bit higher on our average body parts, but we've gotten to our goal faster, which makes sense. If we gain more information as we go, then we'll get there faster. But what maximizing information ignores is your cost of failure. So let's marry those two things. Let's scale information gain by our chance of success. We're back at our same example. I'm not going to go through it, but T is your answer right now. It's a good compromise between information gain and success gain. And OK, we're slightly lower than either one of our options. Awesome. Don't get hung up on the scale of this. This is just one loss function that we're looking at. If we did add in a, a win-loss at five body parts or six body parts and applied like a 100-point penalty to that, this difference would be a lot bigger. So I have a few takeaways here. I'm going to run through them really quickly. They're all backed up by math and that table, but we won't get into that now. You want to optimize for success, not maximize success. You're look, going for long-term success at the expense of short-term failure. You want to ch sometimes when the information gain warrants it, you choose a letter that you know you might guess incorrectly and gain that extra body part so that you can be more successful later on. Maximizing information will always get you to your goal fastest. Maximizing success, similarly, will never maximize or optimize your long-term success. And I want to think about what we've been defining as chance of success. We can either say it's the utility of success or the cost of failure. Not only that, the real world is not like Hangman. We don't know exactly the chance of success or failure. So when we're developing software, we have an expected loss cost of failure or an expected utility of success. <clears throat> so one really important thing that I've learned from this is that if you can increase your tolerance for failure by a little bit, that allows you to make choices that will allow you to get a larger information gain and get you to long-term success faster. And sunk cost. We've all heard of the sunk cost fallacy, and I've proved it here. Well, not really, but. Uh, but as an example, say you guess B and then D. And then you're like, well, they rhyme, so why don't I choose G next? No, no, you, you don't look back in the past of what you've done. We're maximizing information gain and success. That's it. We don't need anything else. So real quick, a real, ex real world example. Test coverage. Would you agree that 50% test coverage is, reduces the risk of a critical production bug than 0%? 100% versus 50. Why don't we keep going? Why don't we hire 10 QA engineers and have them bang on our product for 10, for 10 days? Why stop there? Why don't we write a simulation that simulates the universe? Let's put our production code in and run it for two weeks and make sure we don't see any production bugs. If we're trying to maximize this equation, we have infinite information gain and an infinite utility of success. Sounds like a win to me. But obviously, that's silly. There's something missing from our model. And it's the cost of information. It, it, there's a cost to writing all those tests. There's a cost to hiring those QA engineers. We can't even simulate the universe, so I don't know what that means. But what is the cost of information? Even if we knew, how do we measure it? How do we know that that extra cost is you know, providing the benefit? I'm going to answer that in a second. I'm going to take two minutes instead of one minute, if that's all right. Always give, I don't know. Sorry. Right. I'm going to take one minute. A hint, uh, expected cost, it's an expected cost of information. It's not the actual cost of information. So software development, what is it? It's building the right things at the right time and nothing else. You need to take customer feedback. You need to take project feedback. You need to act as a manager. Even if you're working by yourself. You need, you're not just an engineer. You need to pay attention to all these places, take feedback, and gain information. So how do we figure out how, what the cost and how to measure it? And process does not equal information. Sprint plans, scrum, fail fast, MVP, wh whatever. Processes that are intended to help you gain your information. It works backwards. You need to know what information you need, and you derive processes from that. 
So, last slide, I promise. Explore your expectations. They're just expectations. If you're at 100% test coverage and you write a Twitter notification system, maybe you don't need to spend the time writing all those tests. If you're at a banking institution and you don't have 100% test coverage, maybe you need to try getting there. If you're a company that does both, maybe you don't need 100% test coverage in both. Figure out what works for you. Explore your expectations. Thank you. <laughs> Code's up here.